The first specimen collected of a species is called the holotype. It's kept in a museum as reference for what the species looks like, and over time, generally more specimens are collected to get a fuller understanding of variation within the species. But what happens when a species is discovered and then never seen again? There are many species that we only know about because of their holotype sitting in a museum collection. Or what happens when a species is described off a photograph or a drawing? How do we know the species is legitimate if it's never seen again? This is part two of my series on species only known from a single specimen. If you want to watch part one first, you can click the banner on the top of the screen. Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you like this kind of content, then please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, and even subscribing to the channel. I also want to quickly thank my patrons. It's thanks to them that I'm able to make this content on a weekly basis. If you want early access to my videos, and to have a say in what content I make next, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. The link is in the video description below. Now let's get into the video. In 1873, Major W.G. Mayer wrote a report about an experience he had on the North Island of New Zealand three years prior in 1870. He told the story of a Maori chief who had killed an animal called Kawe Kaweao, which was hiding under the bark of a dead rata tree in the Waimana Valley. The animal was a lizard and described as being two feet long and as thick as a man's wrist, color brown striped longitudinally with dull red. No specimen was collected at the time, and no other evidence existed of the species, so its identity remained a mystery for over a century. In 1986, scientists stumbled on an odd gecko specimen that was being kept in the Museum of Natural History of Marseille. The gecko was huge, larger than any known species of gecko known to exist today. From the tip of its snout to the tip of its tail, it measured 60 centimeters, making it about 20 centimeters longer than the largest known living species of gecko today, the new Caledonian giant gecko. The gecko specimen had no collection information, so scientists didn't know when or where it was collected. But based on the way it was preserved, they believe it had been collected sometime between 1830 and 1870. For over a century, the common practice for reptile specimens destined for museums has been to put them in a bottle with alcohol to preserve every part of the specimen. But this specimen was taxidermied. This meant that scientists had very little of the original animal to examine, as only the skin, skull, and limb bones remained. At first, they believed it was the Kawekaweao of New Zealand, as it seemed to fit the description but there was a problem. All living species of New Zealand reptile have had plenty of their bones found in caves across the country, but no bones of this giant gecko had ever been found before. In 1994, researchers tried to extract DNA from the preserved specimen unsuccessfully. It wasn't until 2023 that the specimen's DNA was able to be successfully sequenced. It turned out that it was most closely related to the geckos of New Caledonia, and likely originated from there, rather than New Zealand. It was placed in its own genus, Gigarcanum, which means secret giant or mystery giant. It's believed that the species is likely extinct, and was likely already extremely rare by the time New Caledonia was colonized and the specimen collected. It was probably arboreal, feeding mainly on insects and fruit. And it probably had a clutch size of only two eggs, as all other New Caledonian geckos do. In 1990, a researcher was walking through the short grass plains that sit at middle elevations of Nekasar National Park in Ethiopia, when he came across the decomposing remains of a nightjar. He was unable to tell which species it was, 
and he ended up only being able to collect a single wing from the animal. The wing was sent to the Natural History Museum in London, where it was examined by experts, but they too couldn't tell which species it was. It was most similar to a female pennant-winged nightjar, but it had a large whitish mark on the outer wing. Due to this unique feature, it was described as a new species, and for the next 20 years, no other specimen was seen, and no one went looking for it. But in 2009, a group of four birder friends from England, South Africa, and the US set out to see if they could find a living specimen. They flew to Ethiopia and hunted down the researcher that had sent the wing to England. He drew a map to the spot in the park where the bird had been discovered. The group then hired a security guard for their quest into the park. They didn't have a permit to enter, but managed to convince a park ranger to let them go in and search. Their plan was to search for the birds at night by shining bright lights across the grass and looking for their eye shines. In the few nights that they spent in the park, they came close to catching a couple of birds, which they believe were the Nekasar nightjar. But they never got a good enough look to be certain, and they never managed to capture one. Evidence that the species is still living in the park is yet to be found. One of the things that makes movies magical is their ability to bring whole worlds to life that don't actually exist. One movie franchise that does this exceptionally well is Star Wars. One alien in Star Wars is the Jawas. These one meter tall humanoids have glowing eyes that are visible in the darkness of their hooded cloaks. In 2012, a new species of animal was described that bears a remarkable resemblance to the Jawas. A new giant cockroach from the mountains of Ecuador, Lusa Hormetica luque. With an overall beige brown color and a black spot on the thorax that has two glowing spots, their resemblance to the Jawas was one of the first things researchers noticed about the species. The next thing they noticed was that it glowed in the dark. When living, the species was probably able to produce light in order to mimic a species of poisonous click beetle that lives in the same area. The cockroach was collected in the 1940s on the slopes of Tungurawa, an extremely active volcano on the eastern side of the Ecuadorian Andes. Being that it was only collected once, it's only known to have lived in one specific spot of forest. Unfortunately, in 1999, that section of the mountain was destroyed by a volcanic eruption. Scientists don't know if the species is now extremely rare or if it's been totally wiped out. But they're hopeful that they're still out there, as rare insects can be hard to keep track of and often go unseen for long periods of time. In 2012, the cockroach was listed as one of the top 10 new species of the year by the International Institute for Species Exploration. They haven't been documented since the first specimen was discovered over 80 years ago. In 1953, two ornithologists spotted a pair of small green doves on the slopes of Mount Canlaon on Negros Island in the Philippines. Both of the birds were shot so they could be put in a museum collection. When the ornithologists went looking for the birds after they fell, they managed to collect the female, but sadly, the male was lost in the undergrowth of the forest. This was particularly unfortunate because in order to classify fruit doves, the feathers of the male need to be closely examined because they all look quite similar. The Negros fruit dove is a small bird, measuring less than 17 centimeters in length. It has bright green feathers with some yellow on the wings as well as yellow eye rings. On the forehead and under the beak, it has small light gray patches of feathers. It's believed to prefer lowland forests, which are essentially gone from Negros Island today. When the birds were discovered, they were at 1,100 meters, and they were believed to have been pushed to those elevations due to human encroachment in their preferred habitat. By 1988, only 4% of Negros Island was still forested. Today, 
the tiny amount of remaining forest is under constant threat of being cleared for agriculture. Two unconfirmed sightings of the doves happened in 1985 and 2008. In both instances, hunters claimed to have shot one of the birds. But today, if the species is still alive, it's unlikely to still be on Negros Island. In 1990, two other birds that were believed to only live on Negros Island were found to also be living on nearby Panay Island, the Negros Bleeding Heart Pigeon and the White-Throated Jungle Flycatcher. Panay Island has much more of its forest intact, so it's possible that the elusive Negros fruit dove is living there, yet to be detected. In 2010, some ornithologists stumbled upon a photo on the internet of a group of parrotlets in a cage, destined for the pet trade. The photo had been taken in Ibagué, Colombia. When the ornithologists, Bertagnolio and Rachelli, looked at all of the known species of parrot from the area, they couldn't find any that matched this bird in the picture. All of the birds photographed seemed to have the same coloration, except one indicated by the arrow. They were green overall, with a yellow ring around the neck. On some of the birds, a blue streak of feathers is visible on the shoulder. Describing a new species off of a single drawing or photograph is considered a legitimate scientific practice. But the problem is that here we do not have a holotype, meaning a clear depiction of a single animal. Rather, a syntype, which is a group of representatives for a new species and none are depicted clearly. The photo is distant and of poor quality, making a clear description of the species extremely difficult. Regardless, Bertagnolio and Rocelli felt confident that the birds were a new species, and they gave them the scientific name of Forpus flavicolis. The next common practice after a new species is named is to publish in a scientific journal for peer review. This allows other experts to determine the legitimacy of the claim. Bertagnolio and Riccelli didn't do this, instead choosing to announce their discovery in the Aviculture magazine. While this publication is scientific, it isn't considered an appropriate publication for the naming of a new species. Other ornithologists were quick to step up and reject the claim that this was a new species of parrotlet. While Bertagnolio and Riccelli are technically correct that there are no species of parrot in the region that fit the same description, especially owing to the yellow band around the neck, what they failed to factor in is a common practice in the pet bird trade in Colombia, feather bleaching. In fact, parrotlets in the Forpus genus are commonly bleached in order to produce unique markings in an attempt to make the birds more attractive when sold into the pet trade thus increasing their value. Many ornithologists argued that the birds pictured were more likely spectacled parrotlets that had all had the feathers on their necks bleached. The South American Classification Committee of the American Ornithologists Union has rejected the species as legitimate. But online debate persists. What do you think? Is it appropriate to name a new species off of a picture alone? And that's it for today's video. During my research, I stumbled on a lot of other species only known from a single specimen, including this species of wild cat discovered in Colombia that's only known from a single skin. Let me know if you want a part three or for this to be an ongoing series. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.